Hello, welcome to AT&T Threat Track for April 28th, 2015. This program provides network security highlights, discussion, and countermeasures for cyber threats. Today we're joined by Jim Clausing online. Welcome, Jim. Thanks. Good to be here again. And here in the studio, we have studio. I call it a studio. Matt Kaiser. <laughs> welcome, Matt. Mm -hmm. And Stan Roloff. Welcome. Hi, Brian. I'm Brian Rexrode, and so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to jump right over to Stan. And uh, Stan, tell us a little bit about, I guess sir, we talked about a WordPress update last week. Right. And I think Jim had talked about that. What's Still different this time here. around? Yep, I guess uh, WordPress is uh, investigated by a lot of researchers because it's actually a high source of vulnerabilities and a lot of web exploits mm -hmm. come through. Uh, well, a lot WordPress. of websites are using it. Yeah, well, it's a good place to be then for an exploiter. <laughs> Uh, I think last week we might have talked about uh, 4.1.2, uh, but this time they switched it around. Now it's 4.2.1 is the new version that you should be upgrading to. Uh, I think uh, WordPress has this uh, feature that you can have automatic updates, and so if you have that enabled, you should have probably gotten it by now. But if you don't, uh, patching is in order. So what is the vulnerability? It's basically a cross-site scripting vulnerability in the comments field. So somebody could leave a, a comment that can redirect people to a different uh, website, mm -hmm. so visitors to your website uh, would maybe possibly run some sort of uh, JavaScript code or something like that. So that's the usual way of how the uh, cross-site scripting uh, uh, vulnerability works. It's, again, a uh, patch. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just uh, interesting. I, I did take a look at it from a technical standpoint a little bit more because I'm always interested in how these uh, vulnerabilities present themselves on the internet. Of course, obviously, uh, we usually you know, don't discuss the specific vulnerability that's present. Uh, one approach I took is I, uh, because the source code is available, I just took the previous version of the source code and the new version of the source code to try to gain some understanding into uh, what may have been patched mm -hmm. so I could know what was the problem and possibly know how the exploit might present itself. It's useful for us to know that kind of information for when we're monitoring and security analysis. It's useful to know how exploits might present themselves. Mm -hmm. So that's the reasoning behind that kind of work. Yeah, and it, this it's been a busy week for, for WordPress updates. Uh, as you said, last week we talked about um, version 4.1.2, and then 4.2 was released the following day along with 4.1.3, which I don't even know exactly what was in that one. But the, this particular uh, cross-site scripting issue, the exploit was released without talking to the WordPress folks because the researcher who discovered the issue complained that he had not heard back anything from the WordPress folks about a similar issue he had reported months ago. Hmm. So he just released the exploit code and the following day there was 4.2.1 and 4.1.4 .4 for those who for some reason can't upgrade to 4.2 yet. And uh, so yeah, it's been a really busy week for, uh, for WordPress updates. So mm. if you've been, if you manage any WordPress sites, you've probably been getting notices that there, you know, was a new version available or a new version applied. The one thing, Stan, though, is um, you, the automatic updating of WordPress will not update you from the 4.1 branch to the 4.2 branch. You have to do that yourself. Oh, well, that's a, that's probably a significant point. Yeah. So the, so um, if you are on the 4.1 branch. 4.1.4 it contains the equivalent patch to what's in 4.2.1 but the if you go to wordpress.org and look at their release notes and their and stuff they're basically saying you need to move to 4.2 relatively soon because uh, they're not going to be backporting a lot of these patches back to the 4.1 branch for very long okay and I think one of the other things we had talked about last week, just for a little bit of reinforcement, uh, if you're using a cloud service or a hosted service, pay attention to who's responsible for what on that service. Uh, this is considered application software, and some only provide basically the patches or the support for the operating system itself. So it's important to pay attention to who's responsible for what. And I think, Jim, you had some comments on that yourself. Yeah, yeah, I've got the... I, I manage a few sites, and I've got a couple that are that these patches get applied automatically, and a couple more where I have to do them myself. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it is something you, you do need to 
be aware of and keep track of. And if you're if you're responsible for for doing all of the you know of the WordPress patching, for example, you need to make sure that you're keeping on top of it and checking into your you know admin dashboard regularly. In the, in the last week, that means daily. Mm -hmm. Get all the updates. All right. Well, good. So the next thing I thought we'd talk about here is a little bit about mobile apps. And um, and this is actually you know, was inspired by a report by Dan Tynan. He's a tech columnist for the uh, for Yahoo Tech. And uh, the report here is basically that one in five Android apps is malware. And that's kind of an interesting t statistic. He took this from the Semantic Internet Security Threat Report. I think this is all based on uh, tw 2014 statistics that Symantec had gathered. And uh, one of the things that was pointed out is about 17% of the Android apps, nearly a million of the ones that were evaluated total, were actually malware in disguise. Uh, a million different apps, that's a significant number. And then on top of that, about one third of all apps were what Symantec calls grayware or, or you know, basically uh, adware, basically things that you know, the, the, their primary purpose is to uh, bombard you with ads or, to, you know, something along those lines. And uh, so I thought this was really kind of, I had to get my head around this a little bit and try to get it, you know, why is this the case? And then so it kind of occurred to me that, you know, good apps are going to generally capture a market and grow their market and continue to evolve their market and remain relatively stable. If it's not a good app, you know, maybe if it, it's just going to go away. Whereas folks that are trying to get some sort of malicious app out into the market, they're going to put it out in the market. It's going to be discovered. People are going to tend to shy away from it, start giving it bad reviews. It's going to lose its market. And so they have to create a new one. And then they have to create a new one. And they have to create a new one. And whether they're you know, basically taking an, uh, someone else's app and kind of cloning it and making it look like it's a, a legitimate one, they're basically, uh, and, you know, basically trojanizing it. They need to follow the dynamics. They can't, they're not really developing a following around the apps themselves. And so that would tend to skew these numbers significantly. That is, they're continuing to develop more and more malicious apps because their market's kind of eroding over time, whereas the good apps tend to be relatively stable. So this, this sort of runs counter to what we thought we knew from the Verizon DBIR that came out a couple weeks ago, which stated that mobile malware really is not a big problem and it's kind of been overblown. This would set, maybe it suggests the opposite, or maybe it suggests that the statistics that they're using are slightly different? Well, I think, they, I think there are probably two things here. One is that I think relatively speaking, the malware that exists in the you know PC world is significantly more and probably more malicious in gen in general. Mm -hmm. That is uh, the opportunities for uh, infecting. And, and when we talk about desktops, we talk about Windows system. We're not even we're not even just talking about a desktop itself, an end user device. It could be potentially be on servers, mm -hmm. and so I think the implications are different in that sense. So th I think the measures are different, uh, relatively speaking. And uh, I, my impression is it's still a very small amount of malware in the mobile devices compared to uh, the, the Windows space or the, you know, the non-mobile device space. I don't think that those two statistics are necessarily contradictory for, the, for some of the reasons that you just pointed out, Brian. There is, you know, you do have to create more malicious ones because the old ones will get blocked or go away and they're following go away but you know the the actual number of uh, good apps you know the, or the the number of apps that are installed on real devices most of them are good very few of the mm -hmm. you know very few of the mobile handsets and tablets and that stuff ha have been infected and that's in part because if you stick to the you know if you stick to the official you know channels, the official app stores, and so forth, th that's not where most of the malicious stuff is. Mm -hmm. Most of the malicious stuff is showing up on these third-party um, sites, uh, especially you, we've seen a lot of it in China and, and South Korea over the years. Um, and so I, I don't know that, I don't think that those are necessarily contradictory terms. Uh, there is a lot of, uh, a lot of the new apps probably are malware, but very, 
but a very small percentage of the devices are actually infected. Yep, very good point, Jim. And and uh, you you actually made the other point that I was going to make, which is that in terms of protecting yourself, so long as you stay with the main street market stream markets, um, the, you're relatively well protected. That those uh, those pieces of malware, if they do get in there, it's relatively infrequent. But if they do get in there, they get taken out fairly quickly compared to some of these other markets. And in fact, you may have pointed out another aspect of this. That is, I think the Verizon reports predominantly sort of a domestic U.S. domestic report. That is, uh, it's done in cooperation with FBI, Secret Service, and others. And so they would tend to be thinking in terms of crimes that affect U.S users, whereas, uh, Jim, as you pointed out, a lot of these uh, mobile malware apps tend to be targeting organizations or, or, or you know, other countries more so than in the United States, partly because of the, the uh, off-market uh, app sources. Anyway, my, I guess my final point here is just another reinforcement of the fact that, um, you know, there really is no free lunch for any of these apps whenever you load them. There's some reason that app exists. If it's free, or appears to be free, it probably isn't free. There's something that, uh, and usually the motivation is monetary, that there's something around that. It may be gathering information or maybe uh, to uh, provide ads, which is one of the, uh, you know, sort of the what constitutes grayware in some of these cases. And so you really just need to make a decision whether that's whether it's worthwhile to you. Make sure you're reading the fine print on the user agreement so that uh, you at least have some cognizance of what your uh, what your payment really is for the apps that you're downloading. All right. So uh, next item here, I guess. Uh, speaking of malware, uh, Jim, this is uh, th this is kind of a cool little twist. <laughs> yeah, it, I uh, I came across this one in um, Arbor's ACERT blog oh, uh, ten days ago or so. The the BDAP malware family is uh, is uh, click fraud type malware family that's been around for oh, a year or so, mm -hmm. I think. And maybe maybe it's only six months, but um, anyway, the what they found, what they reported in the uh, in Arbor's Acer blog the other week was um, an interesting feature in the in the malware's domain generation algorithm, DGA for short. Um, for generating its command and control domains, who mm -hmm. it connects back to, and uh, and the interesting part of this one was that what they do is they use a legitimate XML file that is published every day by the European Central Bank that contains the last ninety days of uh, Euro foreign exchange rates. You know the, how the how the euro trades against other currencies in the world. Mm -hmm. So this is this is a legitimate file. The, the European Central Bank generates this daily, and this malware, the this uh, this you know particular BDEP malware, you, in its domain generation algorithm, goes and grabs this XML file, and uses it to generate the the domains it's going to try to use for command and control for this week. And that was that was just a twist that I hadn't seen before, so I thought it was yeah. interesting and wanted to mention it here. You know, that it's they're going out pulling a legitimate file off a legitimate website and using the contents of that file as part of their domain generation. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that we did with Conficker and with some of the other malware families that have had their own domain generation algorithms in the past is, you know, we we reverse engineered the algorithm and we could generate the domains out for days, weeks, months in advance. And sometimes, you know, some of the good guys would go and register some of those domains in advance so that mm -hmm. you could see some of, you know, get some idea of how many infections were out there. It, I thought it was an interesting twist. I'm not sure uh, what exactly we can do about things like this, but I, I thought it was an interesting twist. In, in well, I think at the very operate. least they could change where they post the file. Mm. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> yeah, we could try that. <laughs> that would st- slow them down for yeah. one iteration of the malware and then update yeah. the malware. They'd have, to, like they'd have to update the malware, and they have to have the command and control in order to do that. So, uh, you know, they, they probably have a backup channel that's kind of a little more hidden, but nevertheless, it's, uh, it's some, anything to disrupt them would be uh, perhaps a... A, a well, maybe they right should uh, host this file on a fast flux domain or something like you know, change the domain, use a DGA to host the file yeah, so everybody who needs it can <laughs> well, get it. But then you've got to do something to, to host that properly. And yeah. the, 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 this is a circular problem. It's a fundamentally, it, it, it exemplifies the arms race here. Well, it's interesting because on one hand, you one of the reasons you set up DGAs is so that no one can predict what sort of network traffic you would be seeing to what domains, mm-hmm. except that you know in every case that there's this URL, it's always going to be hitting day in and day out. Right. So, great, you know the command and control is going over here, but you can detect this thing, unless of course you're using this, this European XML file in, in your daily business. Most people won't Those are probably whitelistable. <laughs> well, I mean, that's what I'm, yeah. if you see this, you, you've probably got a good idea you've got BDEP, until of course they change the URL. Right. Now, you know, putting on my black hat for a second, if I were to find some other file to use for this, this generation algorithm, I try to find something that the majority of businesses are already going to, but doesn't change quite as often. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, it sounds like this only changes once or twice. In the, you know, rather than I, I keep thinking of things like you know maybe the MSN homepage would be something that people go to, but that changes too frequently, mm-hmm. or or some other website, but maybe it changes too. Not it's it's one of those too hot, too cold sort of situations. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh, I, again, I think this uh, just sort of exemplifies this arms race thing, that there are always folks that are trying to create what the next step is, you know, and you know, create, being creative about how they approach their, uh, their malicious activities and finding one way to stay a step ahead of the, uh, the folks mm. that are trying to protect. The other. Yeah. And what if you could modify that file in such a way that you could influence the DGA? And you need to talk to the person owning the server, of course, at that yeah. point. But maybe you can influence the DGA in such a way that you can predict mm-hmm. what the values will be for the next week, and then maybe sync. Oh, that's an interesting ways. thought. So, Jim, do you know happen to know what the um, algorithm is that it, it uses on that file? Is it a like I, a hash? I, there is a uh, the the folks at Arbor have. Uh, put out a Python implementation of it, I have not looked at it. Mm-hmm. Well, the problem is you'll be affecting markets that actually rely on the stocks. Well, I assume that the they're file. using the wraparound as well as, uh, as part of the, uh, as far as, I, that's my assumption, is that they're, they're not necessarily looking at specific numbers, but perhaps taking some of the wraparound and using that. But that's uh, the assumption on my part. So <laughs> that's good. <laughs> yeah, if I were a bad guy, I would probably actually use the values in it. Then, then you couldn't get, then they couldn't change it and manipulate it that way to affect me. Yeah, yeah. I, I got a feeling we could go down this rabbit hole for hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, speaking of rabbit holes or holes in, holes in general, <laughs> yeah, in general. Um, I guess uh, someone's taken a little closer look at OSX, mm-hmm. and uh, I think we were doing a little bit of a comparative analysis earlier. So, Matt, what can you tell us? So, this uh, is research that came out at RSA. Um, tons of stuff happened at RSA this past mm-hmm. week, but this is one of the ones that I thought was particularly interesting. Uh, Patrick Wardle of, I think the, the team is called Synac, did an analysis of OSX security features that are relatively recent uh, and found that most of them aren't really all that great. Mm. Um, in particular, he spent time looking at Gatekeeper, which is, I believe it's the, it's, it's whether or not you can run things that are from the App Store or outside of the App Store, mm-hmm. and uh, Xprotect, which is the built-in antivirus. Turns out that in Gatekeeper, all it takes to bypass that validation that's done is to find an application that's from the store that loads external modules. Mm. Um, in Windows, we would call this DLL hijacking. And the files in, in OSX are called Dilib files, which is dynamic libraries. Same, mm-hmm. same thing, different naming scheme, kind of. Um, but you know, do that, and the validation is done on the main file and not on the external. Your code will run. Um, in Xprotect, apparently, they're still using the old pattern matching, like exact match matching. Mm. So they'll hash a file and compare it to a known list of hashes. Right. So the easy way around that is to modify the file slightly. Apparently, simply compiling it is enough to bypass that check. Hmm. What weirds me out is they claim that even changing the name of the file is enough to bypass that check. And that, hmm. that shouldn't work, at least not in the Windows world. So I'm wondering what it is about that file name that 
and allows that to happen. Maybe they're including the name in the file hash when they create it for right, antivirus. That's a possibility. That's strange. <laughs> and it's a little bit weird for me. So there's, there's other features that are mentioned in this presentation. The sandbox, which is you know, a good thing to have in mm -hmm. an operating system. Apparently, there's a number of vulnerabilities that were released by uh, Google's Project Zero, which can be used to escape the sandbox. So mm. again, there's a bypass for that. The code signing one is a little bit worrying. Typically, when you have code signing, the whole point is don't run code that isn't correctly signed. Mm -hmm. In this case, the implementation seems to be see if the code is signed. If the code is signed and not signed in a valid way, don't let it run. If it's signed and valid, let it run. If it's not signed, let it run. Uh, and the, yeah. yeah, so this is a, it, that's actually a classic implementation that I've seen in other places. Really? Uh, well, let's take DNSSEC for an example. Okay. Do you want to turn off the entire DNS infrastructure because most of it isn't signed? I see what so, you mean. So, so it's all, you know, so it's actually not an unusual circumstance like that. So and uh, it becomes one of these, well, what are you really doing? Are you creating security? Or are you just creating a perception of security in certain situations that uh, you, mm. you end up running into? And it's, it's a backwards so, compatibility sort of thing? You, you so have to deal already. with the world the way it is today. Yeah. And mm. so, you know, the, the fantasy is that you ultimately transition to a point where everything's signed. And then you never have to worry about that other stuff or you, you can basically obviate that. But then there are all kinds of other problems you run into as well. Interesting. But, so, uh, I mean, it doesn't, th those are completely different circumstances, but it is an example where you know, the tendency is to say, well, if it's not signed, then you don't have to worry about it. But everybody has to be on board in order for that plan right. to work. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So there's it's a really a good, very good slides up on, on the RSA conference website. Mm -hmm talks about uh, sort of a, a survey of different persistence mechanisms as well as well as a survey of what current OSX malware is using as its persistence mechanisms. Mm -hmm. So it's a good read. Yeah, interesting. All right. Well, I guess uh, so my question around this, do uh, are, are these really practical issues that we need to be taking a look at, you know, whether we're using Windows or Mac or you know, what are your thoughts? My thoughts are it's probably high time that somebody did take a look at these issues. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like a lot of the things that are listed here are the same kinds of attacks we've seen in the Windows space for a long time. Mm -hmm. I mean, DLL hijacking, everybody's known in the Windows space for a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, and they even mentioned at the start of the presentation that the market share for, for OS X is, is increasing. Mm -hmm. And it's probably time that somebody took a look at this. Uh, because some of the mechanisms that are used for persistence are actually, he'll say, here's what they are, and then he'll go down to the list and say, and this one's using A, and this one's using B, and this mm -hmm. one's using C. So these are all sh things that should be considered in the near future. Yeah, and you know, perhaps this really comes down to the TAC targets. That is, if you're using, uh, you know, depending on what operating system you're using for your critical applications that might be a target for attack, that may have a significant impact on who is motivated to actually develop an attack around that. And um, you know, the thing that keeps coming to mind here are point of sale systems, for example. I, I personally am not aware of any point of sale systems that are using you know, OS, OS X at this point. Mm -hmm. There may be some, but they're not widely proliferated. And I think that's fundamentally perhaps what one of the differences that exists is that as point of sale systems, for example, uh, begin to use other operating systems, they're gonna become a more lucrative target for the, to, to put the effort into developing the... the and we're we're going to touch on that in just a bit, I think. Oh, are we going to do that? <laughs> Imagine that, point of sale. <laughs> so why don't we go ahead and segue in that there, Matt? All right, let's go for it. So um, again, from RSA, more great work. A team of two researchers found out another survey of the state of POS. They, right. they mentioned one vendor in particular. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't able to dig up their name, and you know, we probably shouldn't mention it on the air anyway, but this vendor was using the same admin password for nine years, mm -hmm. and it's, it's depending on which keyboard you're using on the, on the, the device, it's Z66816 mm -hmm. or 166816 which is, either one is not a very good password. No. And especially if it's not been changed for that long, um, eventually that's going to leak. So it's something that's a long-standing, I'd call it a vulnerability. Now, is this something the end users had the opportunity to change? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I would, I would hope that most um, users would. My understanding is that most people who are using point-of-sale systems are not directly managing them themselves. Mm. They're contracting a third-party IT staff 
to set them up. Mm. You know, depending on what sort of diligence that staff is doing, they may just be saying, you've got a working POS system, you're good to go. Or they may actually be setting up and saying, all right, for this customer, we're using this password. For this mm -hmm. customer, we're using a separate one. That would be the right way to do it. So it's, it's hard to say with any certainty. So when you're contracting with a POS vendor, you want to ask them what the acronym really stands for? You do. Okay. These days, POS terminals are still primarily Windows machines with a few mm -hmm. peripherals attached, mm -hmm. usually with USB or sometimes even serial for certain peripherals. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, when the, the basic you know, desktop or server security rules should be applying in this space. Mm -hmm. It seems that in a lot of cases it's not. I mean, mm -hmm. for, for example, you wouldn't use your backend server to play, say, Call of Duty or maybe Guitar Hero, mm -hmm. but the researchers did find evidence that people were using, in a particular case, those P the back the back of house PCs for these purposes. Imagine that. And the funny part is, one of those machines was already compromised, and the keylogger had been picking up the keystrokes for Guitar Hero. So you could see them people tapping the keys, you know, trying to play the game. Mm -hmm. um, in other cases, they were used for more mundane, mm -hmm. but still questionable purposes. Internet browsing, torrents, looking at porn, all sorts of things you wouldn't want, what I essentially believe is critical infrastructure, mm -hmm. to be allowed to do. Yeah. So I think we were, we were saying earlier that this is a space where you know, it's, it has a lot of catching up to do in terms of becoming what we would expect enterprise hardware infrastructure to be like. Mm -hmm. you know, people should be very much aware of what their point of sale system is doing. At the mm -hmm. terminal, if it's, if it's maybe a pin pad or a complete POS system or a back-end server, I mean, these things all need to be protected because credit card information is being stored there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I guess along these lines, perhaps one of the things to recommend folks do when they go out to contract this thing is that even before they go out to to look at candidates for providing a service, to kind of write down what your expectations are from a security standpoint. You know, what are your password management practices? You know, things that you would kind of you reflect on yourself and say, you know, these are the kinds of things that I expect my provider to do. And at the very least, ask them those questions. If not, make that a binding part of the contract agreement. So there's a, at least some opportunity that if there, you run into a problem, you have some opportunity to, to, uh, to seek some retribution around it. Otherwise, you're really kind of, you know, it's whatever they give you, right? Yeah, I feel like there should be a checklist, something you can hand out to small to medium-sized mm -hmm. businesses that use these devices and rely on someone else to, to do the IT side. Well, in fact, I think that's what the PCI requirements are intended to do. But I think they're, uh, this is one of these rough, bal the difficult balances is how do you provide the opportunity for innovation or flexibility, cost effectiveness at the same time as being very specific about the requirements? It's, a, it's a inherently a, a balance that you have to come down to. And I think uh, there are certainly other aspects of this, and I'm certainly not a PCI expert, but to some extent, the retailer becomes a liable for fraudulent activities and so if they contract to a third-party organization it's still potentially the retailer that's liable so it, that ultimately puts it on the retailer to make sure that they're doing the right things so uh, it, your, your point is well taken all this comes down to really some basic fundamental security practices although I never have read a NIST standard that mentions anything about not playing guitar here <laughs> We have to spell it out for you. No Call of Duty one, no Call of Duty two, no Call of Duty one at war. Yeah, I can think of worse security risks than that, but it is certainly uh, one of those things that you want to try to have some controls around. So uh, taking, you know, that was actually kind of a depressing story, I have to say. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it got really worse than I, I even expected myself, but um, it, lots of opportunities for improvement, right? <laughs> So speaking of opportunities for improvement, um, looking at the internet weather for the last week or so here, uh, we had re been reporting on some reflection attacks that were using SNMP, and uh, you know I think last week we reported that it was co coming down. It still is coming down, but I want to keep this into perspective. I think last week I showed sort of a composite that showed that you know this SNMP attack activity is relatively small compared to a lot of the other con contributions to reflection attacks, denial of service attacks. But we should also keep in mind here, even though this peaked out at about, you know, around the order of about two gigabits per second, which is not huge for a denial of service attack, it's still significant from most end users' point of view. There aren't too many end users that have two gigabits of traffic 
capacity at their disposal due to a denial of service attack. Even if we look at what's going on relatively recently, and we're looking at 30 days of activity here, but if we, even if we look at what's going on relatively recently, it's still you know, around 10, what are we looking at? Uh, you know, we're looking at hundreds of megabits, about 100 megabits per second in these, this attack activity here. So it still would be significant to most end users. And so you need to be prepared for these types of attacks. And uh, as I pointed out earlier, this is a, just a small portion of what is the collective uh, amount of denial of service attack activity. Perhaps we'll cover it next week, but uh, uh, Arbor Networks came out with a report relatively recently indicating that they detected the largest denial of service attack in the first quarter of 2015. They, I think they uh, measured it around 334 gigabits per second. Is that the largest ever in the first quarter, or is that the largest of just the first quarter? The largest what they've witnessed, I okay. think. And in, in the first quarter uh, of 2015, the largest they've witnessed so far. Okay. Uh, next item here, we had been talking over the last few weeks about scan sources on port 4143 as well as 4183. You know, we were sort of speculating that it was uh, the P2P traffic, but uh, we weren't able to, to basically uh, confirm that it was actually P2P traffic. So we're looking at 60 days of activity here, and the good news is perhaps the activity has tapered off in terms of the uh, number of sources. We're looking at the number of sources pr producing that activity. It's still present, but certainly not as significant as it was before, and it's still somewhat of a mystery why they're doing this. Now, uh, as we point out before, and it, uh, just uh, with the latest check still consistent with what we've been witnessing, uh, there is a very clear distribution, geographic distribution, that is the port 4143 seems to be predominantly originating from the United States, whereas the port 4183 seems to be predominantly originating originating from either Europe or actually South America as it's showing here. And not even that much in Asia, relatively speaking. Uh, you don't see really any dots in India there and very few in China. So uh, that's relatively unusual considering what the population distribution is and uh, what you might expect to see. So very curious uh, patterns associated with this activity. Next item here is probes on port 5800 TCP. Now that's uh, associated with virtual network computing. And we've seen a lot of cases in the past. We actually have reported a number of times, not so much recently, but a number of times in the past on port 5900 and sometimes even 5901, 5902 that are all associated with VNC. Uh, but in this particular case, we're seeing it uh, probing on port 5800. Of course, as you can see from the graph here, it's not new that we're seeing this probing activity. Most of these big spikes spikes associated with a source uh, or a set of sources from China. Those are the big spikes. What we're seeing re relatively recently here is this activity down in the lower right hand corner. And that is the introduction of basically activity from a uh, US hosting provider. There are actually a couple of addresses that appear to be participating in the activity. So uh, we'll follow that to see how that develops in time. Yeah, and just a, a quick thing to point out the difference, 5900 is is used by the native client and 5800 is 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 a web interface to, mm -hmm. to VNC. If you're managing something with VNC and you've enabled the VNC over HTTP, that's what runs on 5800. All right, very good. Thank you, Jim. Next item here is uh, the most probed ports is the top 10. No real significant revelations here. We've had a little bit of movement. It looks like uh, port 1433 has moved up about five slots. 53 UDP has moved up about six slots here. Uh, but those are all generally ones that we uh, have seen in the past uh, on this, uh, basically on this pie chart. So at the top of the list, port 22 TCP, that's SSH, followed by 445 TCP. We're going to take a little closer look at that in a moment. And then 1433 TCP, followed by port 23 TCP. 53 UDP, most likely probing. And actually, I was looking at this a little more closely, and the uh, port 53, as you know, we often see, we've seen more denial of service attacks on port 53 lately, just kind of flooding uh, DNS servers. And that's not uh, not unusual, but uh, it seemed to have some uh, recent spikes in that space, whereas it seemed to have relaxed for a period of time, but seems to have come back. Uh, we might have an explanation for that, perhaps something to talk about uh, next week. Followed by port 80 TCP, 8080 TCP, 3389, which is basically a uh, 
I'll call it a peer to the VNC that we just talked about, that's the remote desktop protocol. And then uh, port 123 UDP, again, that's a case where it's likely uh, either probing for network time servers, NTP servers that uh, might be used for uh, reflection attack activity, or perhaps some, uh, some uh, indications of using it. This next piece here just shows the scan probes on port 445 TCP. You know, as I'd mentioned, uh, it, it, it's still way up there near the top in terms of the number of probes. It's interesting that we've seen that moving a little bit here. And in fact, what we're seeing is that over the last year, we're looking at the last year of activity, the top graph is looking at the number of probes. The bottom graph is looking at the number of sources doing those probes. So whereas uh, with the conficker kind of evaporating, we are seeing what we'd expect to see, fewer sources doing the probing activity. But what we've seen showing in the top graph there is there is a slight increase in the trend in terms of the number of probes that we're seeing on the network and uh, actually some spiky activity more recently even in the last uh, month or so. So I don't really have a good explanation for that um, other than the fact that perhaps uh, there are some uh, individuals that are out there that are you know, probing the port, perhaps looking for holes in, uh, in people's firewalls. Uh, you know, 445 on the internet to me just uh, you know, <laughs> kind of baffles me. I, it's not one of those things you would expect to see out there, but uh, apparently it is. I wonder if the, the default stance for, for Windows has changed since maybe the XP years onwards to 7 or 8. Have, are those ports still open by default, or are they per perhaps closed by default now when it's, one, there's less of a scanning uh, population to go around, and two, XP boxes are slowly being uh, taken out of service. Possible explanation, total speculation? Well, certainly the XP box is taken out of service, I think, as a, as a contributing factor to the reduction in the number of sources that are doing the scanning. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know, Jim, maybe you have some thoughts. I, I tend to go to you as the uh, sort of the Windows expert. It, have there uh, been any changes in the default configuration in Windows to uh, perhaps inhibit the use of uh, you know, basically file sharing or SMB on the Well, no, devices. not really. Um, although it's, it's possible that there's a little less of it if you configure, you know, if you've ever connected a, a current a recent Windows box, Windows 7, Windows 8.1, mm -hmm. whatever, to your network it, for the first time, you'll get this little pop-up, is this a home network, a work network, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. or a public mm -hmm. network? And if you, you know, if you say public, then it, it it actually does tighten up the firewall rules and and doesn't open up quite as much. But you know, for your home networks and your work networks, the the Winds ports, the AD ports, you know, the 445s are all all open to anything mm -hmm. in the local network. So unless you're constantly saying you're on a public network, um, it isn't really that much tighter. All right. Okay. Well, I think that's significant, though. At least you have the opportunity to think, uh, think twice about how, you know, how the computer is connecting on the network. So, uh, yeah, and it, 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 only, uh, it only does that, prompts you for that, though, the first time you connect to a given network. Mm -hmm. um, if, you, if you later want to change that, you've got to dig back through uh, you know, the control panel and the network settings and all of that. Mm -hmm. All right. Next item here is the uh, top 10 most sources doing the probing. And, uh, you know, quite frankly, not a lot of movement here. We're seeing a lot of the same ports, 445 at the top of the list, followed by port 23 TCP, 27015. Some of these others are actually associated with peer-to-peer uh, -peer protocols, uh, BitTorrent uh, gaming activities. 17788 UDP is one that we were, uh, we considered to be a little bit of a mystery that's been growing in activity but uh, I'm inclined to believe that uh, that's innocuous. So we're gonna investigate that a little bit further. No, uh, no updates on that at this point. So that's our show for today. We'd like to thank you for joining us. And if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at threattrack at list.att.com. And you can find ThreatTrack on the AT&T Tech channel. It's att.com slash threattrack. Uh, and it's also available on YouTube as well as on iTunes. And you can follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at ATT Security. So I'd like to thank you, Jim, for joining us today. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Stan. I'm Brian Rexrode. We'll be back next week with a new episode. And until then, keep your network safe.